This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan, and I am really grateful to have a place to talk about this stuff. Faith, politics, all these big ideas in our culture with all kinds of interesting, erudite, accomplished folks of goodwill in good faith. And it is an honor to announce that our program is now part of the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our democracy and how we can work together to fix it. I'll be highlighting over the coming weeks and months other hosts of of the shows and doing feed drops of other shows like we did last week. Uh, So keep an ear out for that. And remember to subscribe if you haven't already to TPNR. Tell a friend, give us a good rating and leave a review. Easiest way to find our program is the main site. It's politicsandreligion.us. It's www.politicsandreligion.us. Or feel free to reach out to me on social media. Um, on all the apps or the sites or whatever, I'm at Corey S. Nathan. That's at C-O-R-E-Y-S as in Sam, N-A-T-H-A-N, at Corey S. Nathan. All of that helps to get the word out so more people can participate in the conversations like the one we're having today with Dr. Melissa Deckman. Dr. Melissa Deckman is the CEO of PRRI, Public Religion Research Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization dedicated to conducting independent research at the intersection of religion, culture, and public policy. So you can see why that really resonated with with me, and, and I wanted to have Dr. Deckman on our program. Uh, Melissa is formerly the Lewis L. Goldstein Professor of Public Affairs at Washington College. She's a political scientist who studies the impact of gender, religion, and age on public opinion and political behavior. And she's currently working on a book about the seismic impact that Gen Z women will have on the future of American politics. And I can't wait to read that because I need help figuring that out. My oldest kid falls into that category, broadly speaking. So help me. Can you solve the, the problem of helping me understand? Help me understand my kids in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That feels like that should really take a couple of hours. But um, I would just say that the book that I'm writing right now is about the impact of gender on um, the political behavior of Generation Z. And what's really remarkable about Gen Z is that we have essentially a situation where young women are more engaged in politics than young, young men and where young LGBTQ Americans, I call them queer Americans in the book because that's a term that they tend to, to like. And it's a lot easier than saying LGBTQ plus IA. Plus yeah, plus. Yeah. Um, but I think the trend data is showing that queer Gen Zers and women Gen Zers are more active in politics than their male counterparts. That's historically unique. And I think it has the potential to shape our politics in a sort of a more inclusive leftward direct, uh, direction in the next couple of decades. Man, that's so interesting. I did notice I started to read the new survey that came out today or the the research uh, report that came out today. And I did notice that Gen Zers, a higher percentage of Gen Zers than other generations, Gen X, uh, lost generation. Wait, we're way past the lost generation. I'm speaking off the top of my head. So forgive me if I'm getting it all wrong. But a higher percentage of Gen Zers identify as LGBTQ or queer as as um, for shorthand. Is that do, do I have that right? Or you do have that right. I mean, a lot of people say that Generation Z is um, the queerest generation that we've ever had. And we're finding roughly one in four of Gen Z who are Americans born after 1996. So currently, in terms of adults, that would be Americans age 18 to about 25. Um, but about one in four roughly identify as LGBTQ+. Um, that's very different than millennials, um, Gen X, baby boomers, and silent generation, obviously. And our new report that we refer to uh, is really a deeper dive into the demographics of the of LGB2 Americans writ large. So you can take a look at that, but also Americans' attitudes about different aspects of queer rights. So attitudes about same-sex marriage, attitudes about protections and discrimination protections against LGBTQ Americans, and finally, uh, a question about religious refusals. And so this is really, I think, going to be important come later this spring with the uh, Supreme Court, who is hearing a case about whether a website designer who is religious has the ability to refuse service to a gay couple. Um, and so the court has kind of tiptoed around that in the past, but I think with the new conservative majority, many people think that this might become a constitutional right. So we have questions on that topic as well in the national survey. You know, one of the interesting stats that jumped out at me was 
how many people, what percentage of people favor laws protecting LGBTQ Americans from discrimination? I was encouraged to find that, of course, uh, we can expect 90 percent of Democrats, but as many as two thirds of Republicans uh, also supported laws protecting LGBTQ Americans from discrimination. Did you find any of those uh, surprising as well? Well, I, I don't think it's that it was necessarily surprising. We've been looking at this data for a couple of years, and there is broad support among Americans for those types of protections. Um, and in fact, I, the Supreme Court a couple of years ago decided a case that extended those protections to transgender Americans as well and to, to gay and lesbian people. So you can't fire someone because this person is transgender, for example, or non-binary. That's now a constitutional right. Whether or not that holds up, given the makeup of the court, we'll have to see in a few years, but nonetheless. Um, so that's been a larger trend, but I would say that it's definitely, um, a lot of people remain surprised by that because we have all kinds of a flurry of legislation and conservative state legislatures that are really targeting the rights of transgender Americans, and especially transgender youth. And so, so you know, I think this survey is like the tale of two two attitudes when it comes broadly to LGBTQ rights. On the one hand, there's widespread support, growing support for things like same-sex marriage, these protections. And even most Americans say that businesses should not be allowed to refuse service to LGBTQ Americans. But on the other hand, you have all kinds of legislative activity happening, especially at the school board level, happening in state legislatures, geared at kids, geared at transgender Americans. And so I think Americans have started to shift their opinions on transgender issues in some ways. That's at odds, I think, with what we're finding nationally when it comes to larger support for, for, for protections for LGBTQ Americans. It's also a generational difference. And this comes out in the book that I'm writing here. Younger Americans just care passionately about this issue. I think that younger Americans are coming into a world that's far more inclusive and far more accepting of people who are different in terms of their gender identity. Older Americans, I think, are not as comfortable with that. And we're kind of seeing that play out in some of the generational analysis of our of our findings. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It, it seems like we're trying to figure out where the, the proverbial line is, you know, and it, recent Supreme Court cases seem to make a distinction between refusing service generally versus compelled participation. In other words, there was a case, uh, the the cake the cake shop owner whose yes, yeah. creative abilities were would be invested in creating a custom cake. And the cake shop owner herself said, well, if it was a cake that was in my store, of course I wouldn't refuse service, but asking me to create something custom is different. I think that's where the line has been so far, but you're right. It does seem that um, Justice Thomas in particular is eager to explore pushing that line a little bit further at the mm -hmm. state level. Just this week, we saw Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders in Arkansas say uh, pass a, or sign a law indicating that students have to go to bathrooms uh, that are consistent with the birth assigned, uh, the, um, se what is it se biological sex, I think is the wording of that law, um, assigned to them at, at birth. Uh, so there, it, it seems like we're trying to figure this out as a country and a society where that line is. Yeah, what's interesting on that part about the bathroom bills, we've been pulling on that question um, for a couple of years as well. That's not in our larger poll today. Our larger poll just looks at those three questions and some demographic uh, profiling of LGBTQ Americans. But uh, what we found on that is like in 2014, there was far less opposition, even among Republicans, to bathroom bills such as that. And in fact, if you remember, I think it was in Charlotte, North Carolina, the state legislature was thinking about passing a law that would require folks to use the bathroom that matches with the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, and there was actually widespread condemnation. I think the NCAA, the, uh, NCAA yeah. I think there was going to have a tournament and they they left and... And so it seemed to be that more Americans were appearing to be embracing of transgender rights here. But we did a poll that came out, I think, last fall, the American Values Survey, I think, um, and uh, in 2022. And overall, support for those bathroom bills has kind of gone up in the sense of passing them. And really, it's only because it's largely driven by Republicans. And so I think what's happened in the last couple of years is that if you look at Fox News, you look at part of the news sources on the right, they're hammering this message over and over again. And I think opposition to that is really, really widespread among Republicans. And that has kind of driven the averages in a slightly different direction. Um, yeah. Democrats, younger Americans are 
far more opposed to these in action of these bathroom bill, bathroom bills that require people to use the bathroom that they were assigned at birth. So, but definitely this is a cultural wedge issue right now that we're having right now in American politics. Yeah, yeah. I have, um, I was having a conversation with um, a buddy the other day uh, that identifies uh, LGBTQ. And uh, <laughs> she said, newsflash, transgender folks are already going to the bathroom with you. <laughs> you know, but her, her point was a really poignant one. Uh, and it was, you know, I'm, I'm more concerned about sexual predators than I am with a friend of mine who happens to identify as trans, you know, so we have a tendency uh, these days to uh, fall into the trap of oppositional politics without really uh, thinking through the principles, uh, the, the mores that should be of, of concern. So that's, but I realized we just like <laughs> dove right into it. I had a feeling this would happen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I want folks to get to know you a little bit. So your first book, which I guess was an extension of your dissertation, one thing I'm curious about, you know, you're now the CEO of PRRI, uh, an organization that does some of the most well-respected research with some of the most sophisticated, trustworthy me methods. Do you miss the days of having to stuff hundreds of envelopes like you did for the <laughs> surveys you conducted for your dissertation? Oh, my goodness. That brings back some memories. Yes, my... Um... My husband, some friends, my my in-laws were literally around the dining room table stuffing envelopes, <laughs> uh, a, a thousand envelopes to put out into the mail and return address stamped envelopes. Um, yeah, that was those were the days, right? I feel very old just thinking about it. Um, well, I mean, the reality is, is that technology has made it in some ways easier to pull people. And so that's great. But, you know, we're maybe talk a little bit about, we can talk a little bit about how PRI's uh, methodology has changed, like all pollsters. If we went from literal mailing surveys, PRI never actually did that um, uh, per se. We started out in about 2008, 2009. Um, but, you know, most polling was done throughout most of the 20th century through random digit dialing in phones. Um, and now no one answers phones any longer. And so we've moved to on doing surveys largely online. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But, but one thing I think, though, that was pretty remarkable, looking at it now from my vantage point as CEO of, of PRI, is that I had about 57% of respondents respond and send back those surveys to me. And so I had no idea going into it as a grad student, a PhD student. I was just like praying that uh, these would be good citizens who run for their local school boards and they'd be willing to answer these questions that I asked them in this larger survey. So I had a remarkable response rate. And now you're lucky in a telephone random digit dialing survey to have maybe, you know, 1% of Americans respond. So it's really the polling industry in general has changed in lots of ways, some for the good and some for the bad. Yeah. But yeah, I do remember, I do remember stuffing those envelopes and actually entering all of that data by hand into my old computer. And I, you know, so it, yeah, that was a very laborious, a very that's laborious awesome. process. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. So I noticed that you went to St. Mary's uh, College of Maryland and then went to Washington College in DC for your graduate work. Is that the part of the country that you grew up in? Yeah. So I went to American University for my PhD. So that's in Washington, DC, but I am a native Marylander. And I was sort of the rare academic who managed to land a job in her home state. And so I went to a small liberal arts school. I was first generation college student. I had such a great experience. I initially thought I'd go to law school, but I took a business law course and thought it was the most dreadful, boring thing I'd ever, ever could encounter. Um, but I had some really wonderful mentors at the undergraduate level who said, and I love the political science classes. I've always been that kid that watched the news growing up, just have always had an interest in public affairs. And then when I found out I could study it for a living, I thought this is fantastic. So I went to grad school uh, to a PhD program right away, did my, my coursework in Washington, D.C., lived there for a few years, and then ended up getting a job at Washington College, which is a lovely small liberal arts school in Chestertown, Maryland. Um, so I sort of stayed pretty local, which was actually kind of nice. You know, oh, I know nice. a lot of academics end up going really far from where they grew up. Um, I also have a husband who's not in academia, so that was kind of nice, too. So uh, I know I, I have a few friends who are have the trailing spouse issue. They have they're in similar fields or they're both academics and finding a job together can be really challenging. So, oh, but yeah, yeah, so I'm from Maryland. Yeah, I grew up in Maryland. So at what point did you develop an interest in politics and that that intersection that you've studied culture and politics and religion? Yeah, I would say so. I was in um, 
in college, and this is dating myself here, I started in the fall of 1989, and so I graduated in 93. But in my, my classes, you know, I was really struck by the rise of what some people were calling the new Christian right in American mm -hmm. politics, and the really big influence that um, the Christian right was having on the Republican Party. And at the time, I didn't feel like enough, enough people were really, I think, studying it inten intensely. And I was also interested uh, right before I started grad school in 94, then maybe in 1995, I started reading stories about the influence of the Christian right on school boards, and no one was really studying it systematically. So it seemed to me that that would be a good topic for, for dissertation and later a book. But I think I've just always been interested in culture, I mean, a person of faith myself, just kind of trying to understand how religion impacts people's ideas and viewpoints. And I think, too, you know, in looking at your show and trying to demystify and have civil conversations about religion, I think religion in many ways is a good thing, you know, but I think in some ways, too, it can be very divisive. And in this moment in our history, you know, I'm really concerned about threats about Christian nationalism, which we can talk about a little bit later. But I've just always been a politics geek, a religion geek, and looking at those intersection, I think is really, really fascinating in terms yeah. of social science. It's funny how, uh, for many of us, our vocational work springs directly out of our personal history, our families. Our, our... Did you grow up in a religious household? I did. I grew up in a Baptist church, and I then after I got married, um, I became an uh, Episcopalian. I was confirmed in the Episcopal Church. Part of that was that my husband was raised Roman Catholic, so he really liked the liturgy. I also, you know, wanted to be part of a denomination that ordained women. That was really important to me. And growing up, um, my denomination did not. And so, in fact, I wrote a book about the influence of women clergy in their politics. And so uh, I think that I wanted to be aligned with a denomination that was really stressing the, the values that I had in terms of equity and equality and things like that. I think you were ahead of your time because there's quite a, a row in the SBC right now. Rick Warren, his church was asked to leave the, the Southern Baptist oh, Convention yeah. because they started ordaining or having women pastors. Well, you know, the SBC had women uh, pastors in the 1970s, and essentially those folks were generally allowed to stay ordained. But the SBC has become, I think, far more conservative when it comes to gender issues. And um, this is really coming to a head now and on racial issues as well. And so I think that, you know, it was really pretty surprising for a lot of people on the outside to say, how can you say you're going to kick out, I think, which is one of the largest uh, Baptist denominations, SBC denominations in the country, the Saddleback. And I mean, Rick Warren, his book was one of the most well-respected, I think, uh, best-selling books written by a Baptist minister. Um, but I think if you've been paying attention to the politics of the SBC, probably not as, as surprising as you'd say, because I think there's definitely been you know, this tendency to want to reemphasize biblical headship and talking about the importance of patriarchy. And I think gender views is a really important touchstone in understanding our politics as well. And part of that is conflated with religious belief. Yeah. I heard a conversation, a uh, recent episode of Russell Moore's podcast, where he's talking, D Dr. Russell Moore was talking to Beth Moore, uh, not mm -hmm. related. You always have to say that, not related. Anyway, um, I think it was uh, Dr. Moore, Russell, who made the observation that, hey, you know, these really important issues like baptism, we can have a conversation or um, uh, communion, we can have a conversation, but somehow um, issues pertaining to gender, we are, are much more fraught. I thought it was a really interesting observation. And some of the things, some of the problems that have plagued the SBC in particular, definitely underscore that point. And I think a lot of it came to, oh, sorry, I was going to just say, I think a lot of it came to a head with, with Trump's uh, nomination, right, in, in 2016. I mean, Trump, serial adulterer, I mean, not exactly the most moral uh, person in terms of his background. And I think that, you know, a lot of criticism was ra raised by evangelical women of his time in office. Now, some evangelical women have stood by him steadfastly, right, in terms of the the, the uh, Tea Party movement. Now, I say the MAGA movement, I would call them. But, but generally speaking, I think it's where those issues started to come into a head. And a lot of outspoken women like Beth Moore, in fact, just said, I can't be part of a denomination where people aren't taking the task what Donald Trump is and what he stands for. And so I think that's part of the issue that we're, we're talking about. And a terrific book um, is, is one called Jesus and John Wayne by Kristen Dumay. Dumay, yeah. I thought you were going to say Tea Party Women, but that's... Yeah, we'll, oh, we'll that's a, that. also a fantastic <laughs> book. I would strongly recommend it. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, but she really kind of looks at sort of how 
many evangelicals have become very conservative on the issue of gender. And so it's a really fascinating study, a, a, deep, di a deep dive into that. So I'd recommend that to your readers if they haven't read it. Absolutely. We're, we'd love to get um, Professor Jumea on the uh, on the show. But uh, she, she has a very, very packed schedule. So I'm grateful to you because you're a very accomplished writer as well. For example, I was only joking, uh, half joking when I said Tea Party Women. So you wrote the book. You literally wrote the book on Tea Party Women. Came out in 2016. I wonder if you released it even a year later, how different that book would be. Gosh. So I was doing the research. So the thing about academia as compared to my current job, uh, one thing that I actually like about my current job is that we can have a bigger footprint on current conversations. In academia, we have the peer review process, and it takes years of study and analysis and review. Uh, and so I did the bulk of the research for that book in 2012 and 2013, talking to Tea Party women, uh, going to Tea Party rallies. This is sort of the height of the movement, right? And I, re I remember I went to CPAC in 2013. This was the election that Mitt Romney had lost. And the Republican Party had done this autopsy saying, we lost because we're too insulated, because, you know, we're not reaching out to minorities. We're, you know, we're not thinking about what younger people care about. So sorry. Let me turn that okay. off. I think we're the only family in America that still has a landline. And it it goes off like twice a week. And inevitably, when I'm on a podcast. It's all good. I might just keep that on the recording just so people know. I can, I can explain to the young folks. That was a landline. And the landline is. And it rings. And, you know, anyway, go ahead. Exactly. So. So I was at CPAC in 2013. This was the election after which Mitt Romney had lost and the GOP had done a big autopsy and essentially saying, look, we lost millennial voters. We lost young people. We're too insulated. We need to diversify the party. And so that's kind of the era that I was doing this analysis and study of Tea Party women. And of course, Donald Trump went in the completely opposite direction and doubled down on nativism and uh, security and and really talking about you know and not being as inclusive any longer and really painting people on the left as being uh, we would call it woke today but really being critical of things like identity politics and things like that and that was a message that was receptive I think in 2016 because Hillary Clinton was an imperfect candidate lover or hater but you know we were facing of course the first potential female president and you know and that raised a lot of I think a lot of issues, right, in, in yeah. many ways. But nonetheless, so the Tea Party Women book came out in 2016. I'd done a lot of the research really 2012 to 2014. But if I were releasing it today, you know, I was thinking about this. I think what happened with the Tea Party is that the Tea Party has morphed into MAGA. So the Tea Party movement became essentially um, the movement that has really supported and embraced Donald Trump, that has supported and embraced a far more reactionary type of politics, and remember the Tea Party initially, I think a lot of people tend to forget this, but it, it really came about because of the bank bailouts in 2008, 2009. Americans in general were fed up with the, the role of the government. I think we just ended a presidency. George W. Bush was extremely unpopular at the end of his presidency. And while Barack Obama was elected, uh, it really had a lot of strong support. We had a, a protracted economic malaise that we were in. And so some Americans just were quickly, I think, unhappy with the inability of the U.S. economy to, to move further faster. But really, it was the bank bailouts that got people really livid. Like we were seeing on the news that the U.S. government was coming in and saving the banking system, which I think most economists would absolutely say was the right decision because it could have actually gone far. It couldn't, the, uh, the economic conditions could have gotten far worse. But nonetheless, when it turned out that executives were getting big bonuses, Americans were really outraged at all of this. And so a lot of the Tea Party actors I talked to were actually very critical of the Republican Party because they felt the Republican Party was elitist. They weren't talking to the grassroots. They really weren't, I think, connecting with the white working class. And so the party really shifted. But what was remarkable about um, this movement, though, as, as a social scientist who studied gender for years, is that I saw that a lot of the leaders in that movement were women. And so in conservative grassroots activism historically has always been led by, by men. And I thought it was kind of an interesting juxtaposition that on the one hand, you had uh, national leaders and uh, Sarah Palin was really sort of an er early advocate of the Tea Party as well. So you had these women leaders, but of course they were against feminism and they, you know, they didn't find it ironic that they were leaders. And I think in many ways benefited from the women's movement, right? That led to women 
going to college more and to having their own businesses and, and leading to less discrimination against women. Um, but yet at the same time, you had these Tea Party conservative women decrying all of that, but they were emerging as leaders in their own right. So I thought that was a fascinating juxtaposition. But I will say this, I mean, the Tea Party then and MAGA now, um, the women who support the movement are really a minority in the US population in terms of public opinion. And that really hasn't changed. I was just looking at my, my book this morning, trying to look at some of the empirical analyses I did. And I think part of the limitations at the time for the Tea Party is that most of their ideas were just not broadly supported by most Americans and certainly not by American women. And I think one thing that's different from the Tea Party that we now have with MAGA is that the Tea Party framed its, I think, larger political aims in terms of the size and scope of government. And so the Tea Party, much like many libertarians and other groups, have long argued that the size of American government is too big, it creates dependencies, it's bad for the economy, all of these sorts of things. By the time we get to Trump, um, and in fact, some libertarian leaders, for example, I think about groups like, what's the group I'm thinking, Americans for Prosperity, right, or Freedom Works, these kind of libertarian groups that are out there. They're very much of the mind of cutting taxes, reducing government, you know, cutting all benefits. Let's get rid of Social Security even, right? Like these sorts of things there. Trump was very smart and he realized that those programs were broadly popular, but he could still rail against other aspects of American government and talk about things that were more nativist, that appealed, I think, to the biases and sort of kind of racial animosities for, for some people on the base. And so I think that has been a big shift from the Tea Party to MAGA now, because MAGA really Trump basically took reforming Social Security off the, the table. Look at Rick Scott, right, who essentially broached the plan of revisiting. Let's let's kind of make uh, Social Security market based. And no, that's a broadly uh, popular program. Medicare, broadly popular program. So on some of the social issues, you know, I think Trump has changed the dynamics of the activists. That's less on the table. And so I think that's kind of a big difference that we have uh, today. Um, women's role as leaders, though. You know, I don't see them breaking out necessarily as leaders. I mean, Nikki Haley's running for president, but she's not going to become the nominee. I think she's just not going to, she doesn't have enough broad based support, you know, in terms of the, the GOP, in terms of the nomination. But yeah, so it's interesting following all these, these dynamics. When you start to look at individual groups or individuals, like some of the leading figures that you covered in the book, you mentioned Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman is another, Nikki Haley, you also mentioned Kathy McMorris Rogers. Each individual sort of, went from Tea Party to MAGA in their own way. But you can't necessarily put, say, Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin in the same boat with, say, Kathy McMorris Rogers. Have you tracked with each of their trajectories and how, how they've navigated that transition from Tea Party to MAGA? Well, I think that these women that I profiled in the book, the exception being Nikki Haley, who now, of course, joined the Trump administration, served as his ambassador to the UN. I think among many others, sort of skillfully navigated an exit, right, before 2020. And so in some ways, she sort of positioned herself well for a, a political future post-Trump. But the other women, like so Sarah Palin, tried very unsuccessfully to run for a House seat in Alaska twice. Uh, but, you know, the Kathy McMorris Rogers is an interesting one. I think that she is more of that classic Republican, that's the country club Republican, and I don't think that she's necessarily a MAGA person at heart. And so I don't think she's necessarily, but I, I can't, I don't really follow her much, you know, any longer. But a lot of the women that I profiled, I think have since sort of either left politics voluntarily or have been asked by voters not to come back for whatever issue I mean, when they've tried to run run again. The exception being Nikki Haley, who, um, you know, went on to serve in the, the Trump administration. But I do think that this is kind of the dilemma that the GOP faces now in terms of hitching their wagon to Trump. You know, Trump still has a lot of popularity among the base, and he still might be the nominee for president. I mean, we don't know if Ron DeSantis is going to be the eventual nominee. A lot of people are looking at him as an alternative to Trump. The reality is, is that Trump's influence on the party has been really, really profound in terms of the issues that are being shaped. I think he's a divisive figure nationally, but within the party, I think he still has a good shot of being the nominee. We'll have to see how it all shakes out. I mean... Will he be indicted? Is he being indicted right now? We're doing this on Thursday, March 23rd. Yeah. Everyone is looking in New York City. It won't matter to his base. In fact, if anything, they'll probably rally around him even harder <laughs> because it's more evidence that Trump is a victim of the elite, woke, left, left-leaning socialists who want to run him out of office or something. I'm developing a very loose theory to explain this transition. And it seems that the central principle of a lot of folks who are 
big time on board with the MAGA train is more of an aversion based politics. In other words, we seem to have forgotten about a lot of those Tea Party principles, reducing the federal debt, lowering taxes, American except, exceptionalism, just as an example. We've forgotten about those because what's really important to us is we hate all those woke people. We hate all those, you know. We have um, to own CR the libs. Own the libs, CRT, yeah. you know. So that that's that's that seems to be a driving philosophy from one day to the next when I can't figure out, oh, that sounds hypocritical to me, or that sounds like it's at odds with what you said just last week. But what is consistent is this, um, again, uh, I don't know if I use the phrase here, but oppositional politics, as opposed to firmly rooted, you know, Burkean conservatism, William F. Buckleyan conservatism. As a, a scholar, does that resonate? Am I, am I onto something there? Oh, absolutely. I think that we have witnessed in this country growing party polarization, and it's really a challenge and something that I think, you know, it's something that I think represents the biggest challenge in American politics today. There's a political scientist I like named Julia Azari. She teaches at Marquette, I believe. She has said that we in the United States live in a country where we have weak parties, but very strong partisans. <laughs> so um, it used to be the case that, you know, political leaders had more say in who was running for office. And essentially, there was an idea that in order to appeal in a general election, people would have to essentially become more centrist. And so the, the process was one where you could have people that might be, you know, liberal or Democrat and Republican conservative in some ways to agree on things. But at the end of the day, you had to appeal to sort of the centrist voter. Right? This is kind of a back in grad school. There's a very famous book written by an economist named Anthony Downs, um, looking at sort of this political economy of of how we vote. And so we kind of, the, the, the idea was that parties would appeal to the median voter. But now our system is such that far more, we see, I think, especially on the political right, we see far more that candidates are appealing to the base, to try to gin up and get the base out to vote here. Because our elections right now are really very small movements in the general population in terms of the vote can really dictate which way the parties are going to go either way. And so one way to get people in the base to go out is to gen up opposition by talking about how bad the other guy is. And so we do have, I think, this extreme polarization that's often defined more by what we are against as opposed to what we support. Um, one of the greatest scholars today working on this is a woman named Liliana Mason. She's now at Johns Hopkins. She was at the University of Maryland. Um, she's written a, a book, and I believe the name of the book is called Uncivil Agreement. It's about how partisanship has become a social identity. And so, and her work has also looked at this in terms of implications for political violence, which is also very unsettling. But getting back to her original thesis, essentially what she has found is that for many Americans, um, and a lot of Americans, to be honest, are tuned out of politics because I don't want any of that. People are fighting. I'll just kind of ignore politics and go on my very way, merry way. But for people that are really in tune to the political system and they're able to get their news and information from bias sources that just kind of reemphasize those biases and have them exclude and looking at other sorts of data points and information that might challenge their views. What you are seeing is that for many Americans, they essentially, their partisanship has become a part of who they are. And it's married with oftentimes their racial identity and their religious identity. And so if you look at the mega movement, disproportionately, you have far more white Americans who are religiously conservative, who identify themselves as religiously conservative and as a, being a strong stalwart of the Republican Party. And so it's no longer that you're losing an election, but when you lose, it, it really affects your social psyche and your yeah. social identity. And this is not a good place to be. And the problem with that sort of system, you know, it, it used to be the case like 40 years ago, if you went to a Methodist church, you probably were just as likely to be sitting next to a Democrat if you're a Republican or vice versa. There wasn't much emphasis on partisanship within churches and within, within religious circles. Um, that's not necessarily the case any longer. And so when your, your social bubbles and networks are people that look just like you and think just like you, when people suddenly lose an election, it becomes far more existential yeah. than, it, than it used to be. And that's really a problem. And religion's part of that whole calculus as, as well. And we think about partisanship as being that social identity. You know, to put that into, just put some meat on them, them bones, uh, so to speak, um, there was uh, one of the studies that I looked at from PRRI was about, it came out in early February about Christian nationalism. 
And um, you, the, the study broke the U.S. population down into four general categories in relation to Christian nationalism, adherents, sympathizers, skeptics, and rejectors. So first, I was hoping that you could d- um, define those categories a little bit more. But the reason I, 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 you made me think of it is that as I was reading through the study, I thought of the church that I went to for about 10 years after I became a Christian, um, Grace Baptist Church here in Santa Clarita. Big church, about two to 3,000 people go every weekend between the four services. Um, or used to be four, so I don't know how many services they have now. But to put it in concrete terms, when I walk into my old church, the largest evangelical church in Santa Clarita, predominantly white, statistically speaking, there's a lot of people who would likely either be adherents or sympathizers of Christian nationalism. So it, it just really, it was a, it was an eye opener for me. Like, Oh wow, that makes sense. So to your point about what you were just saying, I could not figure out why they thought the apocalypse was imminent. You know, after so many of my friends that I still stay in touch with from that church, it was dire when Biden won the election. And, and, and it explains why some of them, even to this day, refuse to believe that, that you know, uh, all of the evidence that discredits this this idea of a stolen election. But um, mm-hmm. since since we're talking about it, if we could just go back, describe that study and, and maybe start by describing those different adherents, sympathizers, skeptics and rejectors. Sure. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to take one little step back to kind of sure. preface uh, the, the study. I would encourage your readers to take a look at the work of Robert Jones. Robbie Jones is the founder of PRI. Um, He wrote a fantastic book called The End of White Christian America that came out in 2016, won all these awards. It's just beautifully written. But you have to understand, I think, the influence of Christian nationalism today in American politics, especially on the political right. You have to put it in a larger context of demographic change. And so when Barack Obama, for example, was elected president, in 2008, um, we still lived in a country that was a majority of white Christians. And so I think it was about 54% of Americans in, um, in 2008, when Obama was elected president, identified either as a white evangelical, a white um, mainline Protestant, or a white Catholic. So here at PRI, we track religious demographic change uh, through something we call the census of American religion. And in fact, I'd encourage your listeners to go onto our website. We have an interactive map where you can, for example, learn the percentage of white Catholics who live in Rhode Island, if you want to know that. So there's a map that allows you to look at all that demographic data through this American Values Atlas and what we call the Census of American Religion. And so looking at trend data, though, in 2022, I think only about 42 percent of Americans could be classified as white and Christian. And think about that's really, I think, in many ways sort of an evolution that we're having in this country. One of the biggest trends that we're finding in terms of American religion, the biggest, fastest growing group are people that aren't religious at all. People who are the nuns or are religiously unaffiliated. But in terms of politics, you know, if you have grown up in your life, and especially if you are, uh, say, a Trump supporter who's older and white, you often, you probably lived your life in a country where the majority of folks look like you. And suddenly, if we look to someone like Generation Z, one in two, roughly, of Gen Zers are non-white. They're far more or less religious. They're far more likely to identify as LGBTQ. These are very threatening things to a majority, I think, or to many Americans who are older and more conservative than Christian. And so I think when you look at a study like um, our study on Christian nationalism, you have to kind of understand the larger context of that. Because I think that many conservatives and many Christian nationalist adherents really feel that they are embattled and that is that what makes America great is that we were founded as a Christian nation and that in order to remain great as a nation, to make America great again, as Donald Trump often talks about, we have to return to those biblical principles of, of having a conservative theological worldview, essentially. But to get back into the study, what we decided to do at PRI and we joined with Brookings Institution to really have a, a wider examination of just who makes up people what, that we might call Christian nationalists. And you're hearing a lot about folks like this in the news, right? Marjorie Taylor Greene, member of Congress, proudly says, I am a Christian nationalist, and we should be embracing these, these terms from her, her vantage point. And we wanted to know how widespread that was view was among the American public, 
and what it might mean in terms of our democracy and maybe potential threats to democracy. And so what we did was we asked Americans four different questions because we're very good social scientists and we have all these statistical measures to understand that these measures kind of work together. It's not just one question like, is America a Christian nation? But essentially we asked whether uh, respondents in our survey believe the US government should declare America a Christian nation. Should US laws be based on Christian values? If the US moves away from our Christian foundations, we will uh, not have a country anymore. Being a Christian is an important part of being truly American. And God, God has called Christians to exercise dominion over all areas of American society. So Christian dominionism is, I think, a part of some theologically conservative Christian uh, face in this country. But combining all those things together, we created a scale. And so Americans who completely agree, that's kind of the strongest level of agreement. We asked, do you, to what extent do you completely agree, mostly agree, mostly disagree or completely disagree with those five tenets. So Americans who completely agreed with all of those essentially became what we called Christian nationalist adherents. And that's roughly one in 10 Americans. So they're not a majority of the US population, but they're the most, I think, conservative from a theological perspective. But we also found an additional 19% of Americans are what we might classify as sympathizers to that view. Mm. So the adherents are fully on board, um, they believe that America is a Christian nation. And in fact, we should impose perhaps Christian law over the country. What does that look like? For example, that might look like making abortion completely illegal. Right? So there's there's ways that this has kind of come into some of our, our policy making in, in a lot of ways that many Americans aren't happy about. But Christian nationalists would be certainly or Christian nationalist adherents would be happy about. But an additional 19 percent basically said that they agreed somewhat or completely agreed with some of those tenants there. So I think put together, it's still not a majority of the U United States, right? It's only about maybe 29% that would be sympathetic toward or completely on board with the idea of, of Christian nationalism. And I think, again, the more important point is that most Americans, in fact, are not <laughs> Christian right, uh, Christian nationalist adherents, right? In fact, 29% are complete rejectors. These are folks who absolutely disagree with all of those tenets. And the remainder, 39%, might occasionally are, are maybe skeptic, skeptic about uh, Christian nationalism. They might agree on some points, but really that's not their animating core, I would say. From our vantage point, about 29% of Americans either strongly adhere to or at least sympathetic to some of those views of Christian nationalism. And why do we care about it? And so, let me just unpack this a little bit more, and, and I would invite readers to maybe grapple with the study a little bit. So we see, of course, that um, your religious identity is often linked to whether or not you're likely to be an adherent or a sympathizer. And so, for example, the group that is the most likely to um, identify as a Christian adherent or a sympathizer would be white evangelical Protestants. Um, and so we see almost 60% of, of white evangelicals fall into the sympathetic or adherent camp. Other Protestants in general, like Hispanic Protestants, there's some support for that, but not not quite as much. Not very many, many Mormons or Latter-day Saints, maybe only 5% as adherents, but there is some sympathy towards some of those views as well. On the other hand, people who are religiously unaffiliated, American Jews, other sorts of minority faiths, like people like who are Buddhist or Muslim, um, they tend to soundly reject ideas of Christian nationalism, in part because I think they feel that their rights might be jeopardize if, in fact, the vision of a Christian state is to take shape, right? Um, whereas other Americans, I think, are more, you know, there's there's a little bit of variance there. Generally speaking, white mainline Protestants, white Catholics, Hispanic Catholics, tend to be less on board with a white Christian nationalist model than other, or a Christian nationalist model, I think, than other, than, than other folks. And, of course, we find that, not surprisingly, that if you're a Republican, you're more likely to be uh, someone who leans in, in that respect. But really, even here, not all Republicans necessarily, like we find fully 37% are skeptical of of, uh, of this movement here. Democrats, of course, tend to really reject. Um, uh, they're not really embracing uh, Christian nationalism at, at all. But one thing, of course, that really matters, and increasingly we look at our data through this lens, is where you're getting your news and information. Uh, and so if you most trust Fox News or you most trust mm. OAN and really far right sources, you're far more likely to statistically uh, identify as a Christian nationalist and hear an skeptic there. Whereas most people who are watching, do people still watch this? I don't know, the nightly news, the, the mainstream news networks, reading the paper, um, they're far less likely to be, I think, um, identify themselves as, as part of this movement or to be categorized by us rather 
as, as part of this movement. But the final thing I'll say, and why this really matters in terms yeah. of our democracy. Um, so one of the questions we've been keeping an eye on, and I would also say Lily Mason's work, I mentioned her as a political scientist, has really been looking at this as well, is propensity toward political violence. And I think before January 6th, a lot of Americans would say, this would be the worst case scenario that is never likely to happen, right, in the United States. But we look at the violent attacks that happen at the nation's capital, and all of a sudden, I think the this abstract sort of worst case scenario, clearly people are very much unnerved by what happened on the events of January 6th. And of course, the preponderance of misinformation um, that still exists over the narrative of the 2020 election, right? And we still have you know, a majority of Republicans who say that the election was stolen from Donald Trump, right? And they tend, those folks tend to get their news information again from these pretty biased, I think, uh, news sources. But one of the things that we look at is essentially, is political violence ever acceptable? The good news, maybe the silver lining here, is that most Americans disagree with that, right? Only 16% of Americans agreed in this study, in our study, because things have gotten so far off track, true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save our country. Only 16% agree with that. But Christian- Wait, did you say 16%? 16% agree with that. And maybe wow. that sounds like a lot, actually. It does it sound like a lot. Up. That means like, you know, if we have a group of uh, 10 people, one and a half of them are, you know, would support the, the possibility of violence if things don't go our way. That's uh, that's stark. Well, it's even more stark if you look at it by levels of Christian uh, nationalism scales. So we find, for example, 40%. Four in 10 Christian nationalist adherents say that that is acceptable. Political violence would be 40 percent. You know, whereas if you completely reject the tenets of Christian nationalism, only six percent. And so there's a strong correlation between who we identify as people being part of the Christian nationalist movement and propensity potentially for political violence. And that's really, I think, very scary um, in thinking about the health of our democracy. Yeah, no, it, it really is an interesting study because you get a better sense of how many folks either identify as Christian nationalists or at least sympathize with the um, the principles of Christian nationalism. And then we start to get a sense of who who these folks are. You know, are they folks that I'm going to church with? Are they folks that are sitting around my Thanksgiving table? Like, who am I going to be throwing mashed potatoes at by the end of dinner? <laughs> you know, you know, another thing I was curious about, though, is there was one aspect where I thought correlation and causation was there. And in particular, the media consumption habits. Did you see car? Did you see causation anywhere else other than or the possibility of causation anywhere else other than the media consumption part of the study? Yeah. So, I mean, you're, I'm pulling out my methods professorial hat here. And so just to talk about the terminology. So so correlation, we do run some um, what we call bivariate level analyses. And so you can kind of do some tests to see if there are statistically uh, significant differences among some groups with respect to what we call the dependent variable on these sorts of uh, analyses here. And so you're right in the sense that we know that if you are watching far right news and on a disproportionate level, if your most trusted news source is Fox News, statistically speaking, you're more likely to be a Christian nationalism adherent. So, but in terms of causation, uh, so to get at causation, what you need as a, in terms of public opinion research is that you'd have to be able to measure a concept before time, before a certain time period, you'd have to interject something in between and then measure it after to kind of get really at causation. And one of the things we often do in social science is we have these survey experiments where we expose some people to a, a variable, not others. And that's a way of getting at it. But the other way that we work around that is when we do a large cross-sectional study of thousands of Americans, we control for different things at the same time through multivariate statistical analysis here. Um, our Christian nationalism study right now, does we did not do a multivariate analysis, but one of the things I would point, we don't always get a chance to do that, but we did do it for a study we did last year about QAnon. And so if you would have told me 20 years ago, I'd be asking Americans whether they believe that a Satan-worshipping pedophiles control most of Hollywood, the media, and big business, and a not insignificant portion of Americans believe that, uh, I would never have believed it. But nonetheless, this is where we are. It's Here we are. <laughs> human on beliefs, right? And so we've done those multivariate analyses. And we found, for example, most Republicans are not QAnon followers, for example. But I think Republicans are 
twice as likely to be that statistically speaking, as opposed to a Democrats. Consuming far right news makes you like four times as likely to be a QAnon supporter. So there is evidence, I think, for more causation if you are able to do those multivariate level analyses there. Um, but certainly, I suspect if we were to take this this num this the data from the Christian nationalism study, run it through a multi-regression analysis, yeah, you'd be finding definitely causation in some respects. Right, right. And there are some moments when those tendencies, it's kind of like if one of the um, if one of the theories had to do with the law of gravity, uh, there are some moments when, you know, uh, you can test that theory, but it's not going to work out too well for you. And I only half joking, uh, I'm only half joking about that because we just had, you know, the last three years of our country was sort of testing out some of these theories. And unfortunately, I had three different friends, three different fellows that I was friends with that are no longer with us because they were you know, the equivalent of testing a theory of gravity, they were testing a theory, you know, saying that c coronavirus wasn't real and they're, they're gone. It's, it's, it's tragic. Um, so sometimes, you know, when, when it's, uh, when we're joking about some dude with a friend Flintstone uh, hat on the, the horns and the, and the stuff, we can joke about it, but sometimes this stuff is, is quite real. So, you know, the, we, I can't believe we're almost an hour into the conversation and we haven't talked about the abortion attitudes in a post row -ro world. Uh, there was one nugget there that did really catch my attention. I wanted to ask you about because it, it's a, there, it, it intersects with some other issues that we're looking at now. So one in particular, uh, it said among those who say abortion should be illegal in most or all cases, 36% of Hispanic Protestants uh, said they will only vote for candidates who share their view. That was the highest percentage for this factor, even more than white evangelicals. Um, so over the last two or three election cycles, Democrats have wrestled with why they're losing their hold on certain percentages of Latino voter voters. Is this sentiment on abortion an indicator of other factors from your research and from what PRRI is reporting on that Democratic strategists seem to be missing? That's a good question. I think that right now there's a lot of stories being run in the media about Hispanic Protestants, right? There seems to be, from the media angle, I think this perception that Latinos are becoming more Hispanic, in part because culturally they're often more conservative, you know. And I think there's a bigger attempt now by the Republican Party, at least in some circles, not all, but in some circles, to recruit um, Hispanic or Latinos to run for political office to kind of shake the narrative that the GOP is not a big tent. In fact, we want uh, more people of different ethnicities and backgrounds and that sort of thing. The reality, though, is a lot more complicated. So we track, again, as I mentioned, um, religious trend data over time, and we have found, in fact, that there isn't a growth in the number of Latinos who identify as Protestant. Mm. Um, and really, I think they represent roughly three to four percent of the U.S. population. That number really hasn't changed in the last decade. In fact, Latinos are still twice as likely to identify as Catholic as they are to identify as Protestant. And that really hasn't changed in the last couple of decades as well. Okay. The one group that is growing among Latinos are the unaffiliated, like other groups here. And so I think that we're seeing that um, there's actually a decline in religiosity among Latinos that is happening among other Americans kind of writ large. I will say this. I do think that Hispanic Protestants often look a lot like white evangelical Protestants on many social issues, right? And in this survey in particular, when it comes to the litmus test issue, we did see somewhat a little bit of a decline among white evangelicals saying they'll only vote for a candidate who holds their position on abortion. But just a couple of years ago in 2020, we did that same litmus test question. And it was part of, I think, our American value survey at the time. And I went back to look at the numbers before we started talking today on that very question. And at that point, roughly 30% of white evangelicals said that they would only vote for a candidate who shared their position. It did decline uh, in with our latest survey that came out um, last year. But I think what's happened is that with Roe being reversed in the Dobbs decision, it's become a less politically salient issue overall for people on the right. I think the larger and more important finding in the 2022 election, uh, 2022 rather, I think the larger and more important finding in the 2022 study that we had on abortion attitudes is really that the political litmus test issue now matters far more to Democrats who favor abortion rights than it does Republicans who are opposed to abortion mm -hmm. rights. So we've seen that that issue among Democrats who support abortion rights has more than doubled as a politically salient one. And it's really not that shocking in the sense that 
the political stakes are very different now, right? Yeah. I think the salience of abortion as an issue has become far more important for Democrats. And among Republicans, it's a little bit less salient, I think, um, than it used to be, but especially among some of those religious groups, because the political calculus has changed. Right. Well, when I when I dug into the methodology portion of that study, I was surprised to see 23, almost 23,000 people were surveyed. That's a pretty big group. So I was curious how PRI recruits and qualifies uh, those being surveyed. Yeah. So I think one of the most remarkable things about this survey that we released and the on abortion attitudes and also what we released today with respect to the LGBTQ attitudes among Americans is that it derives from our American Values Atlas. And we have, we regularly interview every year at least 20,000 Americans on their attitudes. It's the most authoritative and comprehensive study out there today on public attitudes on those cultural issues here. We work with an organization called Ipsos, um, which has been polling for decades. It's one of the premier public opinion uh, polling groups internationally, actually it was founded in France. But one of the things that we do when we part with, with Ipso, so we actually construct the surveys ourselves and in terms of the, the writing of the questions, and they actually use, they send that survey out to the members of their knowledge panel. Why the knowledge panel is really important. I referenced a little bit earlier the switch from uh, telephone base to um online-based surveys that we're doing in the United States. And so that's been great in a lot of respects, but one problem is that there now is literally hundreds of online panels that you read about or hundreds of surveys that are conducted online. And you have to be really skeptical because anyone can put a survey in the field, um, but you have to try to look for whether or not it's representative of the US population and whether it's randomly based because all of our statistical theory is linked to the idea that there's a random element involved, right? So we can make statistical inference by basically saying, if you're randomly selected, we're trying to reduce the amount of bias potentially that we're introducing. Mm. Okay, so the knowledge panel by Ipsos uses a single sampling frame from the United States Postal Service. And so they randomly select households to participate and be invited to participate as part of their sample. Um, they have 60,000 Americans, literally from everywhere across the country, um, and they ask them to regularly participate in surveys. And so they maybe do two or three a month. And for us, you know, we have a number that they do during, during the year uh, for our purposes here. But the beauty of this is it's a random selection of households. And so between the random selection nature and the large sample size, you know, it is one of the best surveys out there looking at attitudes on politics, on religion, on culture, on different public policy. So it's a really sound and terrific survey. But you're right. I mean, 23,000 is not the typical survey. Um, when it comes to the sample sizes of surveys, you know, you really shouldn't trust anything less than a thousand. But what it means for 23,000 roughly cases is that our margins of error are extremely small, but we're able to report on groups that typically aren't represented in surveys when it comes to religion. And so the odds of you finding enough American Jews to report on, for example, is really small if you're just doing a survey of 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000, because we know that Jews only make up about 1% to 2% of the US population. But with this Ipsos um, knowledge panel, we can kind of burrow down into looking at what Muslims think about this, or what Buddhists think about this, or Unitarian Universalists think about this, because we have enough cases. And generally, if you have fewer than 100, the margin of errors get a little bit too big, and we tend not to report that in terms of survey research. So, so you're not reporting on the Zoroastrians. <laughs> they're, maybe they're out there, but maybe we'd be, I don't know, 40 or 80,000 or something to, to do that. But yeah, that's essentially our methodology. But we really were very proud of the methods that we use. I think they're really good social science. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's interesting to hear how an organization like Ipsos or PRRI has adapted its practices in order to gather accurate data you know, com compared to just, you know, as recently as when you were studying for your dissertation. So I, I, I only have a few questions left because I, I know we have to wrap up our time here, but I, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit. We mentioned at the beginning and I, I, you know, jokingly, but I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about the book that you have coming out. Sure. Um, this book has yet to have a title. <laughs> so, but essentially the point of the book is to examine the influence of gender on the politics of Gen Z and what this might mean for you know the future of America. I'm really fascinated by generational politics, like how the baby boom generation is different from millennials. I we are of course are part of Gen X, which never gets talked about. I will say that, but we've just kind of gone on to Gen Z, and maybe as a parent of two Gen Zers, I'm really sort of fascinated by this by this group. But but Gen Z, you know, there's lots of interesting things happening to their generation that that are not happening to us, right? I mean, they're the first generation to grow up with smartphones. 
Um, they're the first generation to consume media that they tend to produce themselves, which yeah. is both good and bad. And lots of <laughs> um, right. But really, they're a generation that is racially, ethnically, extremely diverse and um, are far more likely to identify as LGBTQ. And I think to be more inclusive in, in terms of those sorts of things. Now, not all. I mean, even among Gen Z, there's, you know, no one is politically monolithic or monolithic on those attitudes, right? But compared with older Americans, definitely a more inclusive um, generation. But one of the things I noticed, PRI actually did a survey with MTV. Remember MTV? I, I used to watch it when music was being played on MTV. I'm not yeah. sure really what's happening on, with the programming of MTV anymore, but nonetheless, uh, they did a survey of millennials and kind of the youngest millennials and and just kind of 18 and 19 year old Gen Zers there. And so we did this survey. It came out in 2018. And I was struck that young women in America were statistically participating in politics in higher levels than young men. And I have studied the gender gap for decades. That's been a big part of my own research as a scholar. And we know that when it comes to political participation, historically, women have been less likely to be involved in politics. Mm. And yet here we were finding with this generation, the reverse apparently was happening. And so I will say this. So generally speaking, except for running for office, women are still a lot less likely to run for office, but that's a whole other podcast we could get into. <laughs> happening. But Anyway, but really about the mid alts, you know, 2005, 2008, women's overall level of participation in the American public tended to catch has taught to tend to catch up. So women are probably just as likely to participate in politics, things like volunteering for a campaign or following political news or going to vote. Actually, women I turn out at higher levels than men do in, in the polls. But nonetheless, overall levels tended to kind of even out. And a lot of people thought it was because women were finally the benefits of having higher education levels, being more professional in the workforce, all these sorts of things that kind of caught up cumulatively, which tended to disadvantage women in terms of participating in politics. All this is a long lead up to the fact that here we're fighting 2018, all of a sudden young women are far more mobilized and far more likely to be involved in politics. And so the book is really an examination of that and about gender writ large. And I think what I'm arguing in the book is that these are young women who've been socialized during the Trump era, right? Their first political memories. And we know as political scientists that oftentimes the memories that you have, the experiences that you have in your teen years, early adulthood stay with you over time. So if you're gonna become a Democrat in when you're 20, the odds are you're gonna be a Democrat 20, 30, 40 years later. Some people individually change, but that's really what the trend data has shown us over time. And yet, so here we have Gen Z women outperforming Gen Z men. And I think part of it is, so I've went and I've talked to, interviewed almost a hundred young, what I call Gen Z political entrepreneurs. These are largely women who formed their own groups and organizations in politics, talked, looked at focus group, but also doing these national surveys of Gen Z Americans. And so I think in 2019, when I did a national survey to kind of replicate the study that PRI had done with MTV, I found that same trend alive and well, that young women were more engaged in politics than young men. And I think it gets back to they're extremely dissatisfied with the political system. They have, for example, new role models. Remember 2018 was the year of the woman and you saw a huge surge and the number of women running for political office and the number of women in, in, in Congress being elected. They're still a minority, but it was definitely still a big, big surge. Um, the power of someone like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, cannot be over, overvalued because she's beloved by many progressive women on the left who look at her as a young woman of color who was, you know, articulating her values and was able to unseat a uh, you know, a guy from Congress who'd been there for decades. Um, so all those things, I think, work together at a specific point in time, not to mention the Me Too movement that really made gender a very salient uh, organizing point for, for young women. So interestingly, though, I replicated this study in 2022. So this was in May prior to the Dobbs decision, because I okay. think the Dobbs decision is going to be a game changer again. But so this was in May, two years into, or about, I guess about a year and a half into Biden's presidency. And what I found is that while Gen Z women overall were slightly higher engaged in politics, Gen Z men have sort of caught, caught up, essentially. And so statistically speaking, very similar levels. But I've also been tracking the engagement levels of LGBTQ Gen Zers. And what I found from 2019 to 2022 is that queer Gen Zers are far more likely to be engaged in politics over that three-year cycle. And I think the commonality between the two years is that whenever... Gen Z's rights are threatened. 
they're willing to become more engaged in politics. And in 2018, we saw a surge, for example, um, in the midterm elections with Gen Z participation. And part of that, I think, was a direct response of the Parkland shootings at Marjorie Stoneman High School. So if Gen Z cares about an issue, they're willing to participate in politics. And so you're seeing relatively higher levels overall compared to earlier generations of younger Americans. But gender, whether it's the sex of the um, individual, whether it's gender identity, those sorts of things are a bigger piece of helping us understand what's getting young Americans to get more involved in politics. And I think the future is if we can kind of get through the next 10 years where we don't have a constitutional crisis and this, I think people um, embracing on the far right, these anti-democratic small d initiatives and imperatives, right, of trying to make it so that minorities are able to keep their lock on power in terms of elections and other things, I think we see a future that's more inclusive at the end of the day, that's going to be caring more about climate change, it's going to be caring about gun prevention, violence, mental health, and things that younger people prioritize that older Americans don't prioritize. So it'll be interesting to see where it, it ends up. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to the book, to, to the book's release. But yeah, so, some encouraging signs, but some some reasons to be Cautious, of course. Um, so is there anything important I forgot to ask you? If, if Dr. Melissa Deckman was conducting the interview, what would Dr. Melissa Deckman ask guest Dr. Melissa Deckman? Gosh, I think that you ran the gamut on basically all of my research. We didn't get a chance to talk about school board stuff, but- um... Oh man, I loved, I, I, I started reading that book and I, it's like, it, so it was released in 2004 and it, it resonates with the work that you were doing in, in grad school in the mid nineties, it sounds like. It, you you could do a whole new edition today. I know. So we didn't even cover that. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, just to really sum that up very quickly, I think the difference between then and now is that in the mid 1990s, I was fascinated by folks like Ralph Reed, who at the time was the head of the Christian coalition. And he was trying to organize people to actually run for school board, conservative Christians to get them onto school boards. And I think the difference now is that it's rearing again as an issue. All these cultural issues are coming to a head. Um, but in the mid 1990s, you really had to be pretty active in churches. You had to be on like the the mails. You had to get mail from groups like the Christian Coalition and books to read to learn how to organize. And now, of course, with social media, you know, people are in a frenzy over certain things, and they just show up at their school boards. And I think it's an environment in which many parents are frustrated with public schools in general over mass mandates, over other things that aren't necessarily cultural. But this environment has led to, I think, a lot of conservative parents who live in rural areas disproportionately can go out and can kind of demand these changes and and talk about cultural issues in terms of sex ed and, and those sorts of things. So parental rights was happening in the 90s. It's happening now in slightly different manifestations. But I would say too, and I'd encourage you to your readers to go find this book if you can even find it in print any longer, who knows? But nonetheless, there's a chapter historically about this, about really looking at parents and religion and culture and, and education. This is nothing new in American it's politics. Nothing new. Trying to go back to the um, fights over evolution in the classroom. You look at what was going on during the Red Scare and trying to, and parents were alarmed that there were pinko sympathizers as teachers, right, in public schools. You look at the sex education battles in the late 1960s. I mean, this is really the alarmist rhetoric of talking about how our kids are being impacted and will, um, you know, are being damaged and are being groomed or all these sorts of things, um, unfortunately, is not new in American politics. Um, I think we're just at the latest iteration of that right now in 2022. So we're still going to be talking about this when my kids have kids. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Who knows? Who knows? I, I think, you know, one of the things to kind of keep an eye on is that many conservative activists have long wanted vouchers for public schools. They're now legal and constitutional. And so I think part of what's driving this, frankly, is also wanting to get the, the government to fund um, religious schools. And so we can talk about how horrible schools are. And so we have an alternative for you. And I think what's kept many parents from using that is the cost. It's expensive to put your kid in a, in a private school. Um, I thought, honestly, what sort of the dying down of the Christian right in public schools in the end of my book, right, when this book came out in 2004, is I think the most, the parents who were the most extreme in terms of their theological views had started to homeschool. And so they kind of took themselves out of the schools, but this is not really necessarily what's happening now. So it's interesting and fascinating and something to keep an eye on, definitely. For sure. Do you have any questions for me? 
Gosh, what do you think is some of the most important things happening with respect to religion and politics today? What, what would you say to your listeners are the things you're looking at and keeping an eye on? So what I think is really important to keep an eye on in order to develop some discernment is the degree to which we're allowing our politics or social preferences to replace religious, sound, theological convictions. Uh, and I, it's one of the very reasons I started the show, because I was having these conversations in my church and Bible studies that where are we going to forget, conveniently forget about certain pieces of scripture, huge chunks of scripture, when it's at odds with our political prejudices, right? And the Trump era has only exacerbated some of those problems. So that's what I think is important. I think it's important to... Um, be discern to to look at this to be discerning about it, and then to take that to the next step because I do know it's important to be able to have these conversations, you know, to to when we do get together for Thanksgiving or in a, a week and a half. I still observe some of the Jewish holidays. My favorite time of year is the Seder, the first night, of, first second night of Passover. So we're gonna have our Seder. Um, which is the organized, uh, it's Seder is for order, like an order of our dinner where we retell the story of Exodus um, in a traditional way. And uh, whether it's family gatherings or church gatherings, other religious gatherings, or just social settings where it's important that we are able to be among others that have differences, you know, not to be in what um, uh, uh, one of my new friends called an epistemolo epistemological silo, you know, um, that we can live next door to somebody who watches different news programs than I do, uh, who goes to uh, observes religiously differently than I do, or doesn't observe at all, and still be able to have not just conversations, but relationships across our differences. So those are a couple of, of the things that I'm keeping an eye on. <laughs> that's a that's a great question. Um, how can we find you online? Uh, PRRI is really easy to find. It's PRRI.org. But how can we find you and, and uh, PRRI and all the great work that you're doing? Yeah, so um, PRRI.org. Uh, please go to our website. You can actually sign up for some emails that we send. So about three times a week, we have what we call the morning buzz. And we um, look at trends in religion and culture. And then we use a shot of our own data for that. So it's kind of a curated look at the news in terms of religion, politics, and culture. Um, we also have sort of monthly emails that go out that kind of highlight some of our major findings. Um, please look at us on Twitter. Um, we're at, at PRRI poll. You can find us there. And so we're regularly featuring our, our research um, in addition to, to that. I would say LinkedIn. Uh, we also have a, a, a poll there. I'm on post. Post.news, yeah. Post.news. And I actually did my post, my first post today, but I can't keep up with all of it. So we're we're looking at new avenues. And I think we have a Facebook, we have a Facebook page as well. Um, that you kind of take a look at, but we just are trying to get the news information out there, um, nonpartisan news that looks at these, hopefully with a, you know, a, a bit of remove to kind of take a look at trends and, and what, what these implications are. So yeah, we're all over. Just check us out, pri.org, and you can download our studies. And for the academics in the group, uh, we are committed as public uh, scholars and part of our public mission is that our data, set, data sets are available and free to the public to use. So we have something called a data portal. So if you're a scholar um, and you're interested in looking at some of our past research, we typically embargo it for a year, but you can go and find out all of our other polls there. And we try to get other academics to use our research as well, because it's really good, high quality data, because we can't get to all the analyses that we like to do. We have only so many staff and so much bandwidth, but um, but really our mission is to try to get that data, good data on religion and politics and policy and culture into the hands of other people that might want to use it as well. That's awesome. I do have one more question. It just yes. occurred to me. How is it being a CEO of a major organization as opposed to, you know, a lifelong academic and professor? It must be a big, big change for you. It's been a big change. Um it's uh, it's never boring. That's for sure. <laughs> like, um, you know, all the different avenues of learning what we do as a comms team and and, and that sort of thing. It's been it's been fun. It's been a good challenge. You know, I uh, I had a wonderful career in academia, and I really did value uh, meeting with and and trying to influence uh, young people. And I still keep in touch with some of my students, you know, to this day. But I think it was time for me, you know, professionally to take on a new challenge. But also, I just really believe in the mission of the work of PRI. Um, part of our larger umbrella frame right now is 
we are looking at religion and renewing democracy. And so um, it's a really important conversation to have. And so I'm really thrilled and honored to be part of it. So it's been great. It's been great. But definitely the learning curve, um, learning new systems and all sorts of things has been a bit of a challenge, but it's been fun. It's been good. That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate you spending some time with us. I know we're a little bit over on time, but this has been great getting to know you better and diving into some of the work. It's just, it's all fascinating. And frankly, a lot of it is really encouraging. I appreciate you coming and spending some time with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Corey. You bet. And as always, if you dig what we're doing here, please hit that subscribe button, leave a review and comments wherever you get your podcasts and tell a friend about TPNR. We're easier to recommend than ever. Politicsandreligion.us. It's www.politicsandreligion.us, where you can find me online at Corey S. Nathan. That's Corey with an E, S as in Sam, at Corey S. Nathan. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. Mm-hmm.